Hello and welcome to Breaking into Hollywood, the Master Course Week 2. Hope you joined us in our event last week. If you didn't, welcome to your second event. Um, my name is Bethan Davis. I'm kind of Gary's Julie the Cruise director to his Breaking into Hollywood, the Master Course. Um, and I am here to set up the show. We have had, I'm really sorry for the delay, by the way. Uh, we're 16 minutes late. Uh, we had trouble connecting with Michael. And we were trying to figure out what to do. He was connecting, and then he was unconnecting, he was connecting, he was unconnecting. And then all of a sudden, Gary said, why don't you just come over? And he was five floors up, as if we couldn't have thought of that half an hour ago. <laughs> anyway, I would like to introduce you to Mr. Gary W. Goldstein, who is the mastermind, obviously, of Breaking into Hollywood, which is a result of conquering Hollywood. Gary, over to you and Michael Shipley. Yeah, that's how powerful. Can you hear me well this way? Yes, we can. You want me to sign it? Okay, so that's how powerful we are here at Breaking Into Hollywood. When a guest has technical issues, we instantly have the power to beam them right here. <laughs> Michael, uh, we, we put him molecularly back together to be with him now. And I'm fine. There's nothing wrong with me. <laughs> like a Japanese horror film. Right. Um, so I, I, meet Michael Shipley. Hello. Uh, who does live five stories up. He lives 50 feet north of me uh, here in beautiful Santa Monica. And uh, I, I have to read you. I was kidding him earlier because I asked him for a bio, which I'm holding in my hand. And I said, you're a dead giveaway. It's, it, I, I am holding in my hand the first bio that I've never wanted to edit one word. You can really tell this man is a writer, natural born to the manner born. So I'm going to read you his bio before we jump in. So Michael Shipley's bio. Uh, other than one year in Eastern Europe when he was four and five years of age, Michael Shipley grew up in the beachside town of Santa Cruz, California, amidst a chaotic square dance of surfers, intellectuals, hippies, and punks. The son of a railroad hobo turned UC Berkeley professor, 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 and professor, and a medical school. Michael's upbringing was odd, but generally wonderful, full of books, theater, and experimentation. Following a post-college relocation to Los Angeles, Michael worked as an ESL teacher, SAT math tutor, and construction worker until he got the chance to write for television. Since then, he's been lucky enough to work as writer or writer-producer for many network comedies, most of which have been that rarest of beasts, sitcoms that are actually funny. His credits include Family Guy, My Name is Earl, American Dad, Andy Richter Controls the Universe, Better Off Ted, and many others. He's currently an executive producer on Last Man Standing uh, with Tim Allen on ABC. He and Eva Longoria recently made 13 episodes of an animated show for Hulu's new original programming division. He sold a pilot script to CBS, and he's working on a new pilot, which he has developed with uh, Vince Vaughn's production company. He's developed pilots with Tony Shalhoub, Toby Maguire, and Keanu Reeves. He's been nominated for an, <coughs> pardon me, for an Emmy and an NAACP award. Michael has also donated his time to several Native American and wild horse documentaries. When pen is not to paper, Michael writes and records music, takes photographs, and lives in Santa Monica. He misses getting to use power saws, as only a writer <laughs> could say. That was embarrassing. <laughs> that was a long intro. I didn't know you were going to do that. I would have put in some stuff now, that was critical of me. Now, now, now that, yeah, exactly. Well, I do have, I do have um, some very, very unpleasant things to now add. Thank uh, God. But, Can I read those? Yeah. <laughs> but, 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 my, Michael uh, is is uh, I am the beneficiary of, of this man being my my neighbor, which you now have discovered. <laughs> <laughs> and a more delightful man you couldn't hope to meet Aww, at, at at the highest levels of life here in Hollywood. So um, that is who uh, we are blessed to have as a guest today at Breaking into Hollywood, and um, I'm gonna I'm gonna just sort of toss toss out the question that we all always like to to know. Like, my, my, Michael, you know, how many years ago did you start writing in in Hollywood? First of all, uh, the first year I was consistently employed was the 1996-1997 season. So 96, 97. So, so that's about 18 about, years. Yeah, 18 years. So uh, yes, things have changed, and yet, in some sense, they haven't changed that much. Yep. Uh, to be honest, and and so the question is, you know, how does Jane Doe, John Doe, 
begin to think about breaking into the See, business. I don't know if I should look at the little picture of you on the screen oh, or the actual well, human you, right you, next to you me. Have to alternate. <laughs> when, when you're looking at me, I'm looking here. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and we are very connected at the moment. <laughs> That's um, right. So how, how, do, how do people actually, um, how should people, based on the nuggets, the oh learnings of your experience, how should they think about making the you know, opening the door and breaking into this business of writing for television? Well, first of all, I don't know. But I, he, he, there are a few things that I think are come in really handy. Um, one of them is, honestly, be good at what you're doing. If you're not good, practice. Um, I would say, even if you are good, practice. I think it's really easy when you're not working in TV yet to take a really, really long time with every script that you work on. And I think it's better to finish them than to try to make them perfect, because they're never going to be perfect anyway. Uh, so I'm a big believer in just write and write and write. Um, the, I, I also think, if this is particular to comedy, but there is nothing more heartbreaking than when I get a spec script from somebody who wants to be a comedy writer and they're not funny. And if you're not funny, go write drama. You can be a great writer, but the competition to be funny in TV, even though most shows aren't, it is really, really tough. And if you're not funny, it's not going to go well. The backdoor strategy for that is to get a writing partner uh, who's funny. And I've certainly seen that happen. If you, if you just love comedy and you're great with story, you have other things to offer, but you're not a joke person, Find somebody who is and partner up, because if even if you write a really beautifully written script, if it's not funny when somebody reads it, it's they're not going to call you. Um, so another thing I was your question there is it not if you're pitching to someone like you, is it not just the script that needs to be funny, but also the hello letter needs to have some humor. Have some humor. Uh, we virtually never get letters. In TV, that it doesn't really happen that way. Uh, you, people get recommended. People get if you're if you're trying to get a job on a show, an agent has to submit you. So your script will show up on a showrunner's desk because some agency was able to get it there. And so there won't there won't be any kind of cover letter in that case. If you're if somehow you meet somebody, if you meet me at a party and convince me to read a script of yours, which I will occasionally do, uh, then I've already met you as a person. So it's, it really does come down to the script at that point. I, I will say, I mean, the next thing I was going to mention, though, kind of goes to that point. It's not, it's not exactly about the letter, but uh, about being personable. I almost can't overstate how important it is to be likable and easygoing, or I would say likable. <laughs> there are versions of likable that are not so easygoing. At a minimum. At a minimum. Yeah. You, you know, when you, when, if you're lucky enough to get to a point where you're being interviewed for a job, uh, they've already read a script, they've already been interested enough in your writing that they're going to, that they're interested to meet you, your job at that point is to make them feel like they want you on their team. And that there's a lot of different ways to do that, and you can't mutate your personality into something that it's not. But if you're an enthusiastic person, be engaged and enthusiastic. If you're whatever you have to offer, offer it to these people in a, in a, in a positive, enthusiastic way. It's really easy. I will say this about writers, especially when you're when you're starting out, at first, those first few jobs, it's really easy to be so focused on your goals and the pressure you're under trying to get a job and trying to get your career started that you forget the enormous amount of pressure the person who's interviewing you is under. They have been fortunate enough to get a show on the air, and that's wonderful, but it's a staggering amount of pressure. And they want more than anything else to put together an effective team. And Part of that is people that they're going to get along with, a really essential part of that, because in nine months when it's 3.30 in the morning, God forbid, but it happens, they don't want to be sitting across the table from somebody that gets on their nerves. 
you cannot overemphasize the difference between feature film and television because whether it's a an assignment or whether you're trying to option or sell a script or whatever, it, ultimately there's only one end goal game, and that's being in the writer's room. That's being on staff and matriculating. And that's why people are looking at you saying, is this someone that I can live with in a contented way uh, at 2 in the morning when we're up against that deadline and it's just not working? How are they going to be to be with in that room? Yeah. And and there there are some really specific things you can do in that. I, th this is jumping ahead a little bit because this is already assuming that you've gotten an agent and you've gotten that first job interview. So I, I, we can talk a little bit more about how to get to that stage. But there are some really specific things that I think you can do in those job interviews that have really served me well. One of them is if you can read the script ahead of time for that pilot, read it. Sometimes you only get to watch the shot version of it, but even if you're just watching it, watch it carefully and think about it and take notes. And when you're being interviewed, try to make sure that you engage something specific and essential about that show. Um, don't don't speak in generalities about just how much you love being a writer. Talk about that pilot. And that doesn't mean criticize it, but engage it and say specifically, I really liked the relationship between that father and his son. It was recognizable, but there was this really unique thing about it that I really enjoy. You know, show that you've really thought about whatever they've created because they've thought about it. Uh, there was a job at Warner Brothers that I got years ago that I think a huge part of the reason I got that job was because there was a there was one odd little interchange near an act break that I really liked in this pilot that I watched right before the interview and I mentioned it to the guy who to the showrunner who was interviewing me. It happened to be his favorite part of the whole script. And it was like, oh my nobody has commented on that. I was so proud of that moment. I was oh, it was it was genuine on my part, but I took the time and energy to pay attention and think, well, he put that in there for some particular reason. It must mean something to him. And I liked it, so why not comment on it and engage him about that? Um, another way to encourage that kind of impression in those interviews is to ask intelligent questions. Now, honestly, there are some showrunners who will barely let you talk during the interview anyway. <laughs> but uh, if you can if you can ask something again that shows a level of engagement with what you're doing, what you what they're doing, you know, like, so are you imagining that the character of the baker is going to be exploring a lot of stories having to do with that homeless guy? Because that seems interesting. You know, just make it specific, make it engaged, make them feel like you're somebody who's already on board with whatever they're trying to do, and they can that'll help them imagine that you're there helping them in that writer's room, because that's what they want. They want you to be there helping them. Can I ask a question ask that's question come up in, 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 as an aspiring as an writer, writer, writer in comedy and working in a TV work show where you need to find a script a week, a week? Should you be should you practicing be preparing on a time limit? Time limit. You mean practicing writing under time pressure? Yes. So that, yes. Yeah, I think that's not a bad idea. I'm uh, I'm writing a script right now for Last Man Standing, and I have uh, probably a week. I probably have seven days to generate a draft. Um, so. I remember when, when I first started, I was writing with a partner, and we would take about five months to write a spec script. And, uh, you know, we were learning a lot, and we were being very careful, but we literally, we wrote our first spec script. We got an interview at an agency. The head of the agency said, this, this sounds like an exaggeration, but he said, this is the best spec script I've ever read. He was probably exaggerating, but there was a lot of enthusiasm, and he said, what else do you have? And we said, well, write something. Five months later, he had forgotten who we were. So, yeah, it's good to be able to do things quickly. Okay. Good to get in that practice. In that practice. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of like James Cameron says about directing. Get in front of a, a brownie camera, any kind of a camera. It doesn't matter. Just keep shooting. If you just regularly shoot and log hours, the rest is about negotiating your fee and your credit. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so right, right, right to the point where... Because speed is really also, it's not just about speed, 
getting to the point where you're actually really fast in turning out screenplays will help you, your intuitive sense, create better structure, better story more rapidly. It's and true. You, you see these people like Genji Cohn writing um, Orange is the New Black, and she's writing every episode. Or, you know, David Kelly was one of those. Aaron Sorkin mm -hmm. was one of those. There are a lot of people in comedy and drama who uh, write every show of the series. You can only imagine what they're producing duties, how fast they are as a writer. There's in, that in TV, that's next to godliness, I would say. Well, it's better to be fast than good. You can't be crappy and fast, but it's better to be pretty good and really fast. Uh, because it, certainly in comedy, you're all, everything is going to go back through the writer's room anyway. You're going to take multiple passes at it. You're going to punch up the jokes. You're going to fix the story. So often when somebody gets sent off on script, you really want them to come back with a solid workable draft quickly. Get back in the room get back in the factory and keep working on it. I think it would be really fascinating, really fascinating for those who for haven't those been who in, haven't that been in that situation is to, if you is could to, walk, us, you through, could walk us through what that script what reading, that is, script about. reading is about. Walk into the room, what, what, happens, happens. what happens. You mean what the process of working in the writer's room is like? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, that mysterious um, inner sanctum. Yes. Um, I, t I tell you what, can I jump back, though, because I feel like, in a way, I didn't properly answer the very first question, uh, which is about, I have a couple more hopefully helpful things to say about the how do I get started part of the process. You're Michael uh, Schindler, you can do whatever you want. Do whatever you want. <laughs> Dude, I'm taking this off. Um, <laughs> no, but not I, uh, that, but not that. Oh, damn. Um, a couple of other things I will say, and these are these may not be lightning bolts for some people, but... Uh, if you can get a job as an assistant on a show, any kind of assistant, just get in there and start meeting the people who are actually making that show, it's, it's a huge, huge help. Because uh, if you don't do that, you're stuck trying to get an agent. And that is so hard to do cold. And it's possible. That's, that's actually what I did. But it's tough. And if you can get a job on a show as a PA and get promoted to writer's assistant uh, and hang around and be valuable and get, a, get given a script somewhere and then you do a good job and they go, oh, let's make her a staff writer next year, that's fantastic. One of the current showrunners on Family Guy started as a writer's assistant. Uh, you know, and he was great. And he hung in there and worked hard. And, and, and both for the... You know, well, uh -huh. both, yeah, I mean, there's two sides to that, and they're fairly self-evident. One is, by osmosis, you're going to learn a ton just by yeah. witnessing and listening and absorbing. But the other thing is that, you know, we're all human creatures, and we like to give opportunity to those people that we feel a bond with, that we're hanging out with, that we, we've come to know, like, and trust, and they're, they're friends. Absolutely. So, uh, being inside those four walls is already a huge step forward. It's, a, it's just a massive help, yeah, in both those... At the second one of those, because of where I am in the process, is, is more apparent. I just think, oh, I, if there's somebody who's smart, who's an assistant, who's working hard, I would much rather try to promote them than somebody that comes in or just even a script and a meeting. I, like, I don't really know them. Um, and, that, and we touched on something that whether, you're, whether we're talking about being on staff or trying to get on staff, the other thing is work hard. Be a hard worker. Again, it's going to make people see you as a valuable asset to what they're trying to achieve, which is to make their show into a giant hit. But they, the moral support that you're giving them by working your ass off is really invaluable. Uh, and, you know, do little extra stuff. Show your commitment to the project. Don't rush out the door at the end of the day. Try to find ways to support what's going on uh, that you're not explicitly being asked to do, whether you're an assistant or a, or a staff writer. I think those things are really, really important. Yeah. It's, like the, it's like the person who stays until uh, the party's really wound down and everybody's out the door except the host, and you get to ask that one question you've been wanting to ask. Right. Uh, that really shows that you're paying attention, that you care. And you help them clean up the party. Yeah. And then they go, oh, I like that person. I'll invite them to the next party. So, um, okay, so uh, in terms of w the, the life of the writer's room, you know, that's something that people ask about all the time, and the, the full answer is crazily long. Uh, but the writer's room is a very special place. It's, um, 
it's this kind of magical world where you shut the door. You're, it's, a, it's a group of people who've all committed to this project. Uh, and again, I'm speaking... Uh, all my experience on TV is comedy, so this is the world of comedy. But you shut that door and you you become this little universe where the rules are different and it's a it's fundamentally a creative generative space and one thing that that means is that pretty invariably every writer's room starts with people just fucking around for a while there's always conversation and it's an essential part of the process because you need to and those conversations tend to be outrageous. They, they often start just talking about the day, but, but the stuff that gets said once that door is shut is really vastly inappropriate in almost every other situation I've ever been in. Uh, but it's a way of convincing your brain and all the levels of your brain that they can take the governors off, that the rules don't apply. You don't have to be polite. You don't have to be appropriate. You don't have to be sensitive to social norms, that this is a space of freedom. And uh, I, yes, I had a colorful, wacky upbringing in Northern California, not easily shocked. The first time I was in the writer's room, I was a little shocked. <laughs> Extreme. <laughs> but it's, it, and there's a, there was a famous lawsuit during Friends, you know, where an assistant tried to sue the show for sexual harassment. And, uh, it, it turned out that it looked an awful lot like it was just a money grab, that there actually hadn't been anything inappropriate that had happened. But it was a very big deal in the industry because if she had won, if somebody had said, oh, legally, you're not allowed to have this kind of shocking, inappropriate conversation as an essential part of what's going on here, it would have really hurt the creativity of television. Um, but thankfully, that's not the way it went. But you can look up that lawsuit online. They have transcripts. And you can see some of the insane, shocking stuff that people were saying. And it's not that it was funny. Uh, I mean, some of it, I think, is funny. But an awful lot of it is just kind of crazy and inappropriate. But it's, that, it's the device for tricking your brain into saying, you're free. Go. Generate. Do whatever comes into your head. Um, so that, for me, in an overarching way, is the most important, interesting thing about the writer's room. Um, the, the process varies a little bit from show to show, but essentially you, you gather, and the showrunner or whoever's running the room, but it's usually the showrunner or the second-in-command, you know, the first order of business, certainly in pre-production, before you start shooting for the year, which is where we are on Last Man Standing currently, uh, is you need to generate stories. And that's the toughest and most unpredictable part of the whole writing process. Um, you sit around and the showrunner will say, sometimes the showrunner will say, I really want to do a story about religion. Or I think there's a really interesting story in this character's relationship with that character. And we'll give you some kind of course heading that you pursue. And... Uh, you talk about it, and maybe you hit on a story in three minutes, or maybe you bat that around for five days and don't ever get anywhere with it. That's what makes it the most unpredictable. Once there's a script, reworking a script is much more a kind of put-it-through-the-factory process. But generating stories can just be brutal. Uh, but that that's a process that a good showrunner, or if somebody is running the room who's not the showrunner, it's whoever's running the room... It's a, it's a subtle and important process to be able to guide that and find, figure out what's going to work and what really feels promising even if you haven't really worked out all the details yet and guide the story in the right direction or hit the brakes at a certain point. One thing that Tim Doyle, the showrunner on Last Man Standing, is a genius at is changing it up. He will work on one thing for a few hours, a couple hours, half the day, and then suddenly he'll pull out something completely different. It's like, well, now we're going to punch up this script. And it'll knock your brain into another place. Uh, but then the next day we're back to story generating, or, that, or at the end of the day, or somewhere. So you have to keep coming back to it. But eventually you have stories. By gonna... Michael, by the time you start production, mm -hmm. how many of the season stories have you broken? Not refined, but how many 
you know, how, how, much, how much ammunition do you have at the ready, um, and how fast are you running to keep up with the train throughout the season? Yeah, well, uh, you're always falling behind. Once you start shooting, you're always falling behind. It's a matter of can you fall behind slowly enough so that you get to the end of the season without everything coming to pieces. But um, <clears throat> it varies. It varies from show to show, and it varies um, also in terms of uh, how much pre-production you have. You know, we started pretty early. We're starting shooting in mid-August or early to mid-August, and we we went. The writers came back to work the third week of May, which is a little bit on the early side. Uh, but the huge advantage to that is hopefully we're going to have, I'm not sure exactly what Tim Doyle's plan is, uh, I think we're going to have a, hopefully five or six scripts written uh, by the time we start shooting. And then we'll have stories for hopefully another 10 or something like that and you know so we'll be a majority a majority of the season yeah we've got because that's the other great variable you know most shows that you end up on these days are only have an order of six or 13 or 12 and we've got 22 so it's very, it was very smart to start really early and start cranking these things out especially because of that that unpredictable quality of story breaking and how does that that's a good point so uh, in the olden days, you know, we, we saw a lot of 22 orders on a very consistent basis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and that's uh, shifted a little bit. So when you have these shorter orders, how does that affect, or, or is that something that people should be mindful of? How does that play into my strategy when I'm trying to get in the game in terms of choice of show or...? Well, it's it doesn't... Um, if you're really starting, if you're looking for an assistant job, I I think probably just picking if there's a show that looks stable, it's been on the air for a while, or it's a new show that there's a lot of heat on and there's it's got a full season order. Probably it's worth just going for that, going for the it's like bridge, you know, your longest and strongest suit, but length is more important than strength. So even if the show doesn't look great, I would probably pick the thing that has the the most longevity because you can develop have a greater chance to develop relationships. Um, if it's a matter of picking a, a writing job on those shows, it's a tough call because, uh, I, you know, obviously it's it's very nice to have a job that lasts a long time. It's rare in this industry. And so, to a certain degree, I really understand people who make conservative choices and say, well, this show has been on the air, looks like it's going to be on the air, I'm just going to go with that even though I think it's not as interesting creatively. The counter argument is uh, uh, I went to college with uh, Marty Noxon uh, who uh, has had a great career and ended up, she, she started on Buffy the Vampire Slayer and she was, she was a, I think she was a staff writer, a story editor, she was very early on in her career and she was offered two jobs. It was Buffy, and I think it was that this show called The Pretender that ha was on NBC, had a lot of heat, really looked like it was going to do something. There was, oh, this was, this was going to... And she was offered, and that looked like a much better job, but she looked at Buffy the Vampire Slayer and went, I have to do this. This is so cool, this crazy, weird little show. Well, for her, it was clearly the right thing to do, but she ended up running the show. I mean, she, she was on that show for years. So there's an argument to follow your heart, and there's an argument to be strategic. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, that's a big, you know, and that goes back way to the beginning, the choices that you make when you're doing a spec. If you decide to do, you know, write some specs, yeah. um, I think that's where it really looms large. Like, choose the thing that lights you up, because when you go into that room or when you get into a conversation, you're going to be so much more naturally uh, engaged and excited and, yeah. and articulate and creative in, in, in that space because it's your brand voice. It's not uh, a forced situation. Absolutely, and I would say even before you get in that room because if you try to write a spec for a show that doesn't speak to you, it's not going to be good. Uh, you know, and your specs have to be good. They just have to be good. Again, if you're an assistant on a show and you're incredibly likable and you're funny and in person, yeah, maybe you can get away with not never writing a spec if you're lucky enough. But generally speaking, the, you know, the specs are your bullets, 
and they, they have to be solid. Yeah. Uh, I know one thing that I did uh, early, again, when I was writing with a partner early on, I was really compulsive about, um, you know, when we, we wrote like a spec Seinfeld and a spec Simpsons, and what I would do is I would sit down and not just watch the episodes, I would, I would take notes and I would try to quantify everything that was quantifiable about the show. I would say, how many scenes are in the show? How long are the scenes? How long is this character's lines? What kind of lines does Jerry tend to have? And I literally, I had a yellow pad, and I would write down all of Jerry's lines, just his lines, for a whole episode. Uh, any th and then I would be able to go, oh, look, all his lines have this kind of rhythm. Or there's three kinds of jokes that Kramer tends to have. They're all sort of structured the same. Like anything I could analyze and quantify, uh, I would, and e even, you know, how many swing sets, uh, what kinds of stories do they do? And it's incredibly tempting, uh, always, but I think particularly when you're starting, to just go with some idea that you fall in love with. But the smart thing to do with spec scripts is make sure the idea you fall in love with is right for that show and doesn't make the show feel like some weird thing that you cooked up, but feels like that show, uh, you know, the, the best compliment that my old partner and I used to get on our early spec scripts was, I feel like this is an episode of the show I never saw. Mm -hmm. And I think that was <clears throat> largely because we were so compulsive about that breakdown of all those, those components that you actually can quantify. And then you go, all right, I'm going to start writing those kind of jokes. I'm going to tell those kind of stories. That sounds like great, great advice, advice for, for any show, show in any, um, any genre, um, genre that you're doing, 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 doing it, whether it's, it's, whether it's uh, Orange is the New Black, is, New Black is, setting out the characters, out the characters. How, many are there, how many are there, how consistent, how consistent are they, are what, they, they what they're like, what the tempo is. Yeah. Tempo is. Absolutely. You know, it could be our dramas, it could be comedy, any kind of a show. Yeah, I think so. Honor the structure, honor the voices of the characters, honor the creator's intention. Yeah. Uh, it's and and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of good but very common advice about spec scripts like don't make your story about some wacky outside character that you think is wonderful but doesn't isn't organic to the show uh, or uh, you know there's a, there's a lot oh and also just I most people probably know this but when we talk about these spec scripts for this show these are writing samples you're never going to try to sell an Orange is the New Black script to Orange is the New Black it's just a way to show people that you can write in that style so it's all the more reason to copy that style as effectively and compulsively as possible you once in a blue blue moon you hear some story about uh, you know, there was a guy, I, I, I met a guy who had sold a script to one of the Star Trek shows, and it was a spec, but they read it and went, oh, we actually want to do this episode. It's very, very rare. It's generally just a writing sample, because people want to see that you can write in other people's styles, because hopefully if you can, then you can write in their style, because that's what they want. Yeah, I, I think in all the years I represented writers, I, I had that happen once, and it was a sitcom. Yeah? It was in the late 80s. Because <laughs> I've never seen it happen again. Yeah, it's very, yeah. very it's rare. It's a great way to get uh, in the door and, and, and potentially hired, but you're rarely going to sell us back. Yeah, no matter how perfect it is, that if the creator of that show is going to be able to read it and go, well, that's not quite right. <laughs> you know, it's like doing a fake English accent for an English person. It may, <laughs> you may fool every American, but you're not going to fool a Brit. <laughs> There's another question that's come up that... Um, in your area, comedy, as a storyteller, how difficult is it or have you trained yourself to have kind of an elastic frame that you, need, you can jump from story to story or idea to idea without something all the way through first? first. I'm sorry, could, did, did you hear that? Just a little bit, something about as a storyteller, an elastic brain? Yes. So yes. what you were saying so earlier, earlier is about earlier being in the being room, room with the guy with you're working with, you're working with, with no ideas, ideas all the time. So as a storyteller, so you might like get, get from A to, to Z, but, but as, a but as a comedy writer, writer, you have to go from A to C, on one script, on one script, and on one script. See what I mean? To have an elastic brain with different things at once. Are you talking about an arc for the season? Yeah, like um, a multi-episode arc, or are you talking about storytelling within a particular episode? 
Um, I think the question means working on different stories at, different stories at, at the same time, same time rather, than rather than finishing all the way through. All the way through. Jumping between. Oh, I see. Jumping, but yeah, the jumping between episodes that are in. Yeah, because what is, as soon as you get rolling a little bit, uh, you yeah, you're there. There's going to be some of you are going to be breaking stories, and some of you are going to be rewriting scripts, and some of you are going to be down on stage supervising the shoot of some kind. Yeah, so there's after the early early days when there's nothing to do but break stories, and that tends to go on for three or four weeks at most. Uh, yeah, you're, there are always different tasks to be done and different things to be worked on. And I think you just have to sort of relax and go with it. A good showrunner is going to pick the tasks for you and say, all right, now we're all going to do X. Or they're going to split the team uh, and say, you three go work on new stories and here, here are some guideposts. You four go take a pass at this script and make these changes and you three go write jokes and here's here's two scripts where I've marked all the jokes that I want beaten uh, and that's and and to a certain degree you often you, you tend to find your place in that kind of factory environment they'll start to identify you as oh your real strength is whatever there was a stretch on um, Family Guy, where I was in a joke room doing nothing but writing jokes for three months, and it, I was with the same two or three guys, and we would just get these pages from scripts. And after the first couple of weeks, you start to lose track. You don't know what the stories are. You don't know who these the, some of the characters are, but they just say, you know, write write a bunch of what we call alts, alternate jokes for this spot, and then you you know you'll sit there and you do nine of them, and then go on to the next one. And then you carry them back into the room, and the way we did it on Family Guy was we would pitch it out loud to the room, and if something got a big laugh, it would go in. If nothing got a big enough laugh, you go back and you write another nine jokes for that spot. Uh, and but it got very disorienting because yeah, by month three you feel so disconnected from the rest of the process. But that was the that was effective show running in that case because they liked the jokes that were being generated and they had people working on other stuff and you just take your factory job as it comes. And then there are these shows uh, that's that's unusually divided. Family Guy is such a joke driven show. Uh, sometimes we would have three different joke rooms running all at once just to generate all those jokes. Uh, but most shows, you don't split up quite that much. And then, yeah, you just go with whatever you're whatever you're How big is with. the writing team, the staff on the last man standing? Uh, it's, been, it's been shifting around a little bit. I think there are 11 of us, 11 or 12 of us now. Like close to a dozen. Yeah, which in this day and age is a pretty big staff. Uh, it's a great staff. We have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of senior writers who run... Roseanne and Grace Under Fire, great oh, classic yeah. shows. Gary, I'm not sure Gary, if I'm your sure headphones are plugged in because I'm getting feedback like from your end, your end and it's being mentioned. Being mentioned. So while you're checking that out, I'm, 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 I'm playing a loud electric guitar. Is that, is that what it is? Um, okay. He's using okay. his foot pedal a lot. <laughs> okay. There's a question okay. coming up from yeah, Joe. I'm reading Joe. Can you see that on screen? Uh, hold on. <laughs> It is comically Either small. Writer, Michael, you've ever, have you ever had issues with the changes that a showrunner has suggested, and what did you do? Right, good. Oh, yeah, that's a good. I, no, I have. Uh, I have always agreed with everything showrunners tell me, especially <laughs> my current <laughs> boss. He has his degree from the Fletcher School of Diplomacy. You're absolutely right. Um, <laughs> no, it's it's a really good question. Um, I uh, uh, no, you're, there are points at which you're always going to disagree, and you have to. Well, there's two things. One, you have to gauge the personality of the showrunner and your relationship with them. How far can you push it, and what kind of mood are they in? Um, I've ha I've been lucky enough to mainly work with showrunners that you can you can push back and make your case, and they will at least listen. Uh, and sometimes you can convince them if you make the case in a positive, enthusiastic, clear-headed, articulate, and concise way. That's an important list of adjectives. Um, 
but equally important, yeah, is is being able to, you know, it's their show. And uh, at a certain point, you have to, and that point is pretty early on, fold and do whatever they say. And uh, even if you disagree with it, do absolutely your best to get on board with whatever they have in mind. And if you need to ask questions, not in a passive-aggressive, I don't know, this seems pretty stupid. Um, is this really what you want? But, I mean, <laughs> you need to ask questions in some way that uh, to clarify what they're shooting for, that's great. Uh, but just be a team player and do it and give it your best shot um, because it's their show. And, you know, it's, it, these scripts also, you, you end up taking pass after pass at them. And a certain amount of the time, if you do it and it really, really isn't working, it'll be obvious the next, in the next stage of things. And if you dig in your heels and make too big of a stink about it and the showrunner's ego starts to get involved, then they can't back off later because now they're losing to you. And it, it just it gets very messy. It can become a very, very long season. Yeah, and you, you just that, you want to get right exactly. You want to you want to be getting along the best way you can with everybody, and 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 that's that's an ideal version of it because it, it can be really frustrating. And I've definitely been on shows where my draft or somebody's draft that I really like gets rewritten, and you just look at it and you think this is so much worse. We should have just shot what they wrote. It may not have been perfect, but it was better than this mess. Uh, it happens, but then you look around and you think this is better than having a real job, and I'm really lucky to be here, <laughs> and let's all just have the best time we can. You know, there's there are things you can do and things you can't do. How much how much interaction do you have, Michael? Uh, on the, I mean, it varies from show to show. I know, depending on what your what hat you're wearing. Yeah. Last Man Standing or Family Guy. How much interaction do you have with the 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 um, the, the talent with the mm. directors. Um, how much are you on the set? Uh, it does vary. It varies a lot. Um, yeah, on uh, on Family Guy, I had you know I was I was relatively low level and had very little interaction with the talent. Uh, I've been on show. One way that some people run shows when they're single camera is if it's your episode, you're on set for the whole shoot. Um, but sometimes that's not true. So if that's not true, if the showrunner likes to be there or he likes he or she likes to have the second in command on set, you might rarely speak to the actors all season. Um, it's, it, it, I, I have some background in acting. I did a lot of theater when I was growing up. So I seem to get along well with actors. Uh, so on Last Man Standing, I end up on set a lot. Um, Tim Doyle sends me down there to just keep... You always want some representative uh, from the writing staff, some producer person, writer-producer, kind of keeping an eye on things as when things are being pre-shot, certainly during tape nights on multicam sitcoms. Uh, and so Tim Doyle sends me down there Quite a bit. I, I get along with the directors. I get along with the actors, um, and I like the. It's it's the, it's the compulsive side of my personality coming out again because I, I, I like being there and making sure we get, each little piece that we're going to need in editing later, you know, thinking did we right. truly get a good version of that line or, uh, what about that word? Did is do we really need that? You know, there's a weird uh, OCD quality to some of that activity, but but it's it's fun trying to keep track of that and imagine what's this? Are we going to have all the pieces when we get to editing? You know, that's, that's the important question. That's the critical question. Yeah. Michael, I think we should wrap this up. We've kept you long enough. I uh, would love you to come back at some point when we can get the connection properly. <laughs> sure thing. It was a pleasure. Thank you. I've, I've already forewarned him, pre-warned him. He's he's a recidivist. <laughs> yes, I'm hooked. Okay, if you've got okay, questions for Michael, questions for Michael, they'll send them through. Send them through. Gary, Gary, your headphones are plugged in somewhere. somewhere. I'll, I'll switch out in a second. Okay. Once okay. we get Michael from the room, from the room. Um, if you have um, questions for Michael, questions for Michael uh, please, uh, continue please continue adding them to the stream them here, and we will forward them to Michael, and hopefully get an answer for you.
So, Bye. Gary, Thanks, everybody. thank you very much, Michael. Lovely to meet you. you. My pleasure. Thank you, my friend. Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, this has been amazing. And we will continue this conversation. Wonderful. And I'm going to give you back this year. All right. <laughs> Do we need to hit? Oh, good. You are good. Wonderful. So, Michael, I will, I will be in touch shortly, but thank you, thank you. I'm sorry so, for... obviously, the uh, apartment to live in in Santa Monica is the one that Gary, Michael, and who knows whoever else lives in there. We need to get that address. <laughs> <laughs> building with no street address. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Take care. Right, Later. I'll talk to you soon. All righty. Thank you, Michael. Oh, my pleasure. Oh, what a <laughs> sweetie, Gary. Why about that? Yeah, I'm so sorry about the feedback, everybody. There was, uh, as you know, we had technical issues, and then there was a um, microphone issue there. So sorry about that. But wh what a great guy, Gary. Can you not hear me? Gary seems to be having technical issues. Yeah, Michael is a doll and, and so talented. Can you not hear me? We can now, yes. Yes, we can. How's no, that? We're, no, we're fine now. You were fine with the headphones. You were cool. Okay, what I'd love okay. to do before we All wrap right. this up yeah, completely, he's, Gary. He is. What? What I'd like yeah. to do is talk a little bit about breaking into Hollywood, the master course. Uh, he touched on so many points that are covered in the master point uh, in the master course, from getting to know people, making those contacts, making sure you know your business before you're going in, having your authentic voice ready for when you go in to meet people, um, having the confidence. I mean, we cover all this stuff in the master course. Do you want to do a quick roundup because we're we're over time here on how the master course was inspired from the your book Conquering Hollywood and what it's aimed to do for people because it really is a fantastic system you've got going here. Yeah, no, it it the the book uh, uh, we're blessed that the book has really hit a nerve. We got con consistent. Uh, you know, overwhelmingly positive. I mean, the kinds of responses where people say, oh my gosh, I've never, this is a gap, I've never heard this information, it's so clear, and yet there is the issue of how do you apply all of these basic ground level strategies, the things that actually open doors that create shifts in your career, how do you apply them to yourself? And that's the hardest thing for all of us to do, right? We're all in the same boat when it comes to that. So. The coursework was a labor of love that took, you know, the better part of a year uh, to come up with just the right formula of interactive, uh, very clear progression of sort of research and questions leading people through this process so that at the end, um, they've been through these exercises so deeply, uh, so clearly that they really understand what their unique approach is, what their brand is, how to speak about it, who to target to get to know, all of these pieces that come together to create real career momentum, movement. So basically the idea is the coursework applies the strategies you read about in the book in a very specific way so you have an action plan and you know exactly how to move your, 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 your way through the system, if you will. Okay, one of the emails we've received during the week based on last week's show was what kind of time commitment do you expect for people participating in this course? And we've had a lot of signups, which is fantastic. So glad that people yeah, are amazing. To it's taking amazing. advantage of this. Absolutely. Uh, so it's a ten week. It's a ten module course. What it, what what are your time commitments that you expect people to be able to dedicate to this? I think I think it's really basically a module a week. Uh, here's the, pr the, pr the supposition. It's important to say how we expect people to sort of ex anticipate people doing this based on our experience. 30 minutes a day. That's really the investment we expect people to make toward it. Five days a week, take your weekends off. So if you do half an hour a day of uninterrupted, very important, not while you're on Facebook, but really just focus on this for half an hour a day, five days a week, you should easily be able to complete one module in a given week which means that you're going to take 10 weeks to complete the whole of the course. 
Consistency is important. Some people will move through it a little faster. It's basically an eight to ten week overarching process, um, and that's the time commitment. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Gary. No, oh, that's okay. I found it absolutely fascinating listening to that interview because so many of the points brought up, I know, are covered in this in this coursework. And I could see some of the questions coming up, and I'm thinking, well, that's in Module 3. That's in Module 4. You need to go check that out. Um, Rhonda has kindly put up links to breakingintohollywood.com. On there, you'll find a summary of every single module. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about what each module does? Because it is a challenging course. It is asking you to do some work. And that has been built in so you actually get something out of it. You're not wasting your money. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about how we've built in, how you've built in, the, uh, the, the coursework, the interactive elements? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the coursework is, there are 10 modules, and we can go through very, very quickly what they are because I, I know we're, we're, we're running out of time. But uh, they're, the way that they're constructed is so clever, and Beth, and you had a hand in this, uh, it's 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 really quite. I've never seen coursework constructed this way. Um, there's certainly some text to sort of set the context to get your mindset right about what is the real outcome we need here. Whether it's networking, whether it's branding, whether it's your desired outcomes, whatever category of information we're in, whatever bucket, um, we want you to leave that series of exercises really with a very clear new set of informations in your brain about I'm going to do these three things. And when you start to put those all together, oh my God, you've got clarity, lack of confusion, you've got an action plan for the next six to 12 months. So the way each of the modules is built is there are a, there, there a series of, it's text, it's quiz, and the quizzes aren't conceptual, they're not really essay, they're very specific. These are the five things you need to answer right here, and, it's, and, it, and, and it might involve a little bit of research uh, that you can do easily online. Uh, and, and then there's social prompts. There are things that we ask you to do socially, either in concert with other people because you learn faster together and you share and learn with and from each other, or because it's important to start to seep it out into the world and market yourself. So it's basically this Mobius of text and, and, and exercises uh, and, and social actions uh, all woven together and uh, you know, on average, I'd say every 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 module is sort of in the area of twenty to twenty-five or thirty pages maximum. Okay, uh, we've got a great question here from Anne. Is your master course self-paced then, so you can start at any time? Fabulous question. Thank you, Anne. Yes, absolutely. We start, and the order is very specific. It's very there. There are no accidents here. So. Uh, module one is networking. We start with the the core, and from there we start to refine and slice and dice so that you really get a very sophisticated understanding of what you need to be doing and how to think about it. So you do module one, networking, and only when you've completed that do you move on to and have access to module two, and so on sequentially through the whole of the course. Yeah, it's and, and it is self-paced in that sense. Great question. Let let us just run down the modules uh, really quickly. I have them here. Module one is networking, uh, which is obviously something Michael talked about a lot just now. Uh, module two is branding, which is another thing Michael just talked about a lot right now. Module three is your DO list. That's your favorite, Gary. Do you want to talk about that? Um, your your DO list is your your. What does that stand for? That stands for your desired outcomes, um, and. Um, this is about how you 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 want to break down. Here's the here's the, here's the challenge. Most people, because they don't have another way to think about it, they have no experience, and they're doing what other people are mimicking what other people have told them. They tend to do the same thing. A writer, for example, would generally reach out to uh, people that they want to read their material, and as a stranger, without having built the bridge of rapport that built any relationship, they'll say. Please give me a couple of hours of your life and read my script. We say no. There's an easier way to get people to start the yes habit, saying yes to you because you're asking them very simple but very valuable, succinct little things that occurred during a several-minute phone call. At the end of the phone call, when you hang up that phone, 
the person on the other end of the phone has no more work to do. They don't have to spend the next several hours reading and responding to your screenplay. You do that several times and suddenly you have separated from the herd. You are now a familiar, friendly personality for whom they're going to step forward a little bit. They're going to meet you, so to speak, conversationally, and they're going to continue. They might refer you. You might introduce them. There's, we have a whole list of things. We actually have a menu. Like You can research them and find out. Ask them questions that honor them. Make them your mini mentor on the phone call, and you do it very intentionally. You can find out interest areas of interest and send them articles or blogs or whatever that feed into their, their aspirations. You can uh, introduce them to other people. Introduct Introduce them to other entry-level people, other assistants, creative executives, low-lying people that could be very useful for them if you understand what their career agenda is. So it's very, very um, strategic and simple and smart. It takes all the, all the charge, all the onus off this interaction. It makes it more fun, more comfortable, more confident for both sides. So you begin to become friends. And Michael just said himself several times how important that is, that you want people to like you on set. That's the way you're going to grow in this business. And uh, that's what part this is telling you. Module 4 is the assistant, your most valuable asset. We're just going to run through this quickly. All the information, all the breakdown is on breakingintohollywood.com. Module 5 is building your dream team, which is extremely important legally. Uh, module 6, uh, get smart, get legal, get protected, which is another kind of offshoot on that. Uh, uh, module 7. Identifying your most powerful story and testing, testing, which again is stuff that Michael and Gary have been discussing this evening. Making every meeting count. Um, and this is valuable stuff. Take control of your content. Create your own content. Take control. Persistence and determination. All things Michael and Gary have talked about tonight. Gary is teaching you in this master course how to do it and how to do it authentically. Not what you've heard works on the street. But what you what works based on Gary's decades in the business of knowing what has been successful and what hasn't. It is so important that you are true to who you are, and 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 celebrate that and share that with people, uh, which I think a lot of people are afraid to do. The more you do that, the faster people can embrace you. And 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 yes, yeah, so everything you've said, Beth, and I'm not going to echo it, but. Everything Michael's talking about touched on so many things that are present throughout the coursework, but we just go a little bit deeper so it really uh, becomes, you know how to implement. It's really critical to know how to put these things into practice. We have a e uh, question from Michael. Um, how is the course delivered? Email? Um, yes, that is the answer. Is email. I right? email. So uh, do you want to talk that one through? Yeah, basically, what happens? You sign up for when you register for the course. You're going to get an email that is going to give you access. Uh, you're you're going to uh, have you know presumably have a Google Plus. You you Beth know this better than I. Some Google Plus. You have a Google Plus account, but uh, you get a link, and that link opens up Module One right away. So you start at the beginning, and as you work through it, you have a notebook. So all your all your responses are there so that you can refer to them, you can share them, you can keep them indefinitely. And then when you get to the end of the module, you literally push the button that says end of module. And at that point, it's done. Now, you could always go back, but it's done. And then you get the next link for module number two or module number three, et cetera, and so forth. So, yeah, you just keep cons progressing through the ten modules until you get to the end. Right. All right, let's wrap it up, Mr. Goldstein. Fabulous show. What a lovely man. Lovely, lovely man Michael is. And, and, and the, the beautiful thing is, Beth, and I, I have to say this. You know, I think people, there are so many great people, just like the people on this call, really good personalities who just love being in a creative profession. And if we all learn how to navigate it together, oh, my God. You can have the life that you want. And that's what the course is all about when you come right down to it. And there's so many great people who are willing to help you and aid and abet your cause along the way, like Michael Shipley. And uh, we're going to be having those uh, special guests on every Tuesday for the next few weeks. So please continue uh, keeping an eye on our Google Plus page here. So, uh, yes, we'll be updating the Google Plus page. You guys can put your own stuff on there. Gary will answer you. 
Um, if you have any questions at all, the information is there, the contact information. Gary, loving you. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you all for, and thank Rhonda, thank all of you listening in. You have a beautiful evening. Have a good night.